There are many experiences in life that a person must encounter in order for them to truly say that they have lived. And one of those experiences is accidentally drinking spoiled milk. I was fortunate enough to avoid uh, this um, tragedy for the first decade of my life, but somewhere along the time I was in late elementary or or early middle school, um, and for those of you that uh, have had this experience, you know uh, what I mean when I say uh, it bit me. Uh, Well, it sure enough um, bit me. My dad and I had stopped. I don't exactly remember where. It was at a gas station, convenience store or something. And I had picked out one of those little yellow plastic bottles of Nesquik that has the bunny on it. And I just, you know, I mean, you go in and you, you just pick it up and you run out and you go on about your day. And so we had already left the store and were headed down the street when I opened up this bottle of Nesquik and took a rather large swig uh, only to have it bite me back um, and wake me up. I was convinced Uh, And still am to this day that that is when hair started growing on my chest. Um, If you have ever, if you have ever tasted the curdles um, before you tasted the milk, um, it's it's one of those scariest moments when you open the refrigerator. You see the date is just a little bit beyond, and so you're bringing the carton towards your nose to just smell. It's kind of like when you're getting ready to give blood. You you know it's not going to be that bad, but you're like, would you just hurry up and get it over with? It's, um, it's very much like that. Maybe you can remember being a parent. Uh, maybe I mean, some of you had some grandkids, maybe not small enough for this to be very applicable today, but you remember uh, finding that lost sippy cup in the SUV or the minivan and wondering whether or not it was water or if it was something else. Because if it was something else, it was going to be the apocalypse when you opened it up. You just <laughs> knew that that was coming. Let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Judges 8. Today we're going to conclude our look at Gideon. And just like that milk that can go sour, uh, Gideon does so. Gideon curdles and goes sour. He doesn't become an evil man per se. He just spoils. He ends up ruining his ministry. He he ends up ruining uh, the people that are following him and he ruins his children in the process. And one of the lessons that we learn from Gideon is that when we take our eyes off of the eternal, our priorities go astray. Um, Let me pause one more moment before we dive into chapter 8 and just say, I I understand as I stand here and read from Judges 8 in our scripture reading for the day, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard because we're not very familiar with those types of passages. And it's hard because, well, there's a lot of names in there we don't recognize. And it's talking about things that are just a little bit uncomfortable. But may I just remind you that this is God's Word. And it is important that God's people hear God's Word and not just Romans or Acts or Psalms or some of the other places of Scripture that are just so encouraging and uplifting to you and to me. And sometimes, as difficult as it may be, that's the passage we need to be hearing. When we left Gideon last week, he had pulled off one of the most incredible upsets in military history with only 300 men and no swords. He defeated this massive Moradian Midianite army of approximately 135 thousand men with with not even a single casualty on his side and you picture the scene of people opening champagne bottles and lifting up Gideon and carrying him around on their shoulders which does happen for a while but soon enough the thrill of victory wears off as it always does and it leads to two incidents within the camp of Israel the first incident uh, within is within the tribe of Ephraim that you read about or that you heard me read about in verses 1 through 3. They were a very large and wealthy tribe who had their pride hurt because they were left out of this military victory. And so they criticized Gideon for forgetting them. They felt insulted and slighted. And the second incident involved two smaller townships, uh, one called Succoth and the other called Penuel in verses 4 to 9. And they balk at one of Gideon's commands because they just don't take him all that seriously. And what's interesting is that their offenses are really rather quite similar. Both Ephraim and Succoth and Penuel are committing acts of insubordination. But what's so striking is how differently Gideon responds to each of them. You see, to the larger 
and wealthy Ephraim, Gideon responds with flattery to try to woo them over because he needs them and he needs their money. But to the smaller towns of Succoth and Penuel, he responds with harshness, actually going so far as to torturing the leaders of Succoth by wrapping them in the briars and beating them until they are dead. And then he levels the town of Penuel and kills all the inhabitants there. It's a quite different reaction, but it's because they're smaller and they're weaker and he doesn't need them. And the most striking thing in all of this is that in neither instance does God, I mean, does Gideon consult God to ask God what God wanted? Uh, you know, as mighty and successful as Gideon was at this time, he simply does what he feels like doing. Success for Gideon used to mean figuring out what God wanted. You remember when we were introduced to Gideon, he was constantly pleading, God, show me this, and, and God affirmed this and confirmed that this is what you would have me do. But now, because of a little bit of success, he has some strength and he does whatever he wants to do. Well, all of this leads to these three areas of temptation for Gideon. Temptations, by the way, that we face today as well. He succeeds in avoiding the first, but he fails in the final two. And I want us to look at those before we have the Lord's Supper. The first temptation that Gideon faces is secular temptation. Look at verses 22 and 23 if you have your copy of God's Word open to chapter 8. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. The Israelites were so impressed with Gideon's victory that they come to him and they ask him to become their king. The word rule there has this idea of dominion. They're offering Gideon and his family a perpetual kingdom. Uh, did you notice that their offer is for him and his son and his son's son, his grandson? The people of Israel are just like people in every age, the man that can give them what they want, peace, security, success, and wealth, is the man that they want to rule over them. We even see this during Jesus' own life in John chapter 6. We just finished a study in the Gospel of John. In John 6, after he feeds the multitudes, how does the Bible say that the people responded? When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. And perceiving then that they were about to come and to take him by force and make him king, Jesus withdrew again to a mountain by himself. All that Israel cares about is the fact that Gideon is a great warrior and that he can offer them safety and security. And thus they come to him and offer him the crown in 1 Samuel 8 verses 19 and 20, the nation of Israel will, will repeat this very request for a human king. And their reason is that they want to be like the other nations. They would rather be like everybody else rather than to have God as their king. And the same trend can be seen in our world today. Churches and Christians alike are all falling all over one another in an effort to be like everybody else, where the people of God should seek to be different and follow Him, regardless of where other churches are. Where are the people who have the backbone to stand against secular temptation and stand up for the things of God even if they're standing alone? Well, in this case, Gideon gets it right. He sees their request for what it is. Gideon knows that he didn't defeat the enemies of his own ability. He knows it was God and God's power that gave him the victory. The people of Israel should have been worshiping and thanking God for the victory. Instead, they're thanking Gideon and offering him kingship. They failed to see that what, while Gideon was the instrument that God used, God was the one that was wielding the instrument. And so Gideon does exactly what he should have done. He refused their offer. He reminded them that the Lord would be their ruler. By the way, that will still work today. Did you notice that the majority is not always right? It was the majority that cried out, crucify Him. It was the majority that tried to throw Jesus off of a cliff in His hometown of Nazareth when He preached in the synagogue. It was the majority of Israel that refused to enter Canaan that led to the beginning of all of this. We tell our children and our grandchildren to beware of falling into the trap of if everybody is doing it, then it must be right. And yet we need to be reminded of that ourselves. If you've been 
regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit and you've confessed your sins to God and called upon the name of Jesus for salvation, then God expects you to yield to His will for your life. The Apostle Paul reminds you and me, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. God expects us to live like we're saved people. And when we don't, there will be a price to pay for our rebellion. One more thought before we move along. Did you notice when this temptation came? When did this temptation arise before Gideon? It came on the hills of great success. We're never more vulnerable to falling into the sin of this temptation than when we've experienced great victory. Proverbs eight, uh, 16 verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So Gideon overcomes this temptation with a very firm no. He denies himself the glory and the honor. He delights in bringing glory and honor to the Lord. Sometimes you and I need to be reminded that we need to say no. That's what Joseph did when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife. Sometimes we need to say no to our friends. Sometimes we need to say no to our family. Sometimes we need to say no to ourselves. There are times we just need to say no and God help us to have the backbone to do it. The second temptation that Gideon faces is spiritual temptation. Verses 24 through 27. Right after he gets done kind of being on target, he falls off. And Gideon said to them, let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings of his spoil. And they do so. They give him a a, a lot of, of gold. 1,700 shekels is essentially 43 pounds of gold. That doesn't count the purple robes and the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the other things that he brought to the table. And so while Gideon says to the people, no, the Lord will rule over you, his actions are saying, but I want to. And so Gideon faces a spiritual temptation. It's the Lord that that is their king, but in this breath he betrays those words. If he wouldn't be king by title, then he would be king by treasure. He requested that each of them give the gold earrings. And we have a little parenthetical comment that they had gold earrings for they were Ishmaelites. And you said, now wait a second, I thought he had just finished defeating the Midianites. And that is true, but the Midianite... um, Uh, Alliance had extended so far as to include Ishmaelites in that. Gideon retained the kingly symbols of this royal robe and the crescent ornaments. It's probably the biggest mistake is that he assumed a king's role in sponsoring cultic idolatry. Because those very same verses go on to say what he did with the gold that he asked for. He took it and he turned it into an ephod. If you've been around the Bible for any length of time, you're probably familiar with that term ephod. It was a a vest-like garment, kind of like an apron that God told Moses to make for Aaron as the high priest. It was part of the high priestly vestments that the high priest would wear uh, into the presence of God when he was making the request on behalf of the people to God. And the ephod, per God's instruction, was only to be worn by the tribe of Levi and only when they were serving at the tabernacle. And so Gideon has now taken upon himself the privileges that belong only to God and has directed people's attention away from God and to himself. Daniel Block is Professor Emeritus of Old Testament at Wheaton College. He wrote a rather large commentary on Judges, and listen to what he says about this. The irony and twistedness of Gideon's actions should not be missed. Instead of himself, the image of God, clothed with the Spirit of God, Gideon created his own image and clothed it with pagan materials. Gideon is faced with this spiritual temptation And he falls victim in attracting the Israelites from all over to this cult of the ephod at Ophrah. And Gideon established this town as his capital. So not only has he made a huge mistake in creating this ephod, but by placing it in Ophrah, he's he's encouraging the people to come away from the place that God had established when they crossed the Jordan, which was Shiloh. 
And he was encouraging them to leave the place that God had created to come to Ophrah. Taking all these things into account, then the conclusion is inescapable that despite his protesting being enthroned as king, Gideon actually assumed the role nonetheless. And for the first time, idolatry is officially sponsored by a leader of the nation of Israel. Gideon is not only a study in contrast, he is a study in confusion. Here's a man who claims to know the Lord, and from all accounts he did. Here's a man who turned down personal glory to promote the glory of the Lord. And yet here is a man who allowed himself to get caught in a trap that was so obviously wrong that it would be laughable if it weren't so terrible. You say, Pastor, what's all this railing got to do with me? How careful we need to be in our own lives. There are plenty of things that come our way that appear so innocent on the surface. Often we fail to understand that those seemingly innocent things can be the tools and the traps that the devil will use to destroy our influence and testimony. So before we embrace anyone's cause, before you and I jump on the bandwagon, before we act on the latest good idea, ask yourself, is this consistent with God's Word? Would it bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ? For you see, Gideon lost his testimony because he failed to keep God first in his life. The same thing can happen to any of us sitting in this room. We must be sure that God, His will, His Word, His worship are what motivates us as we pass in this life. The third temptation that Gideon faces is social temptation. Look at verses 28 to 32. And so Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more. And the land had rest for 40 years in the days of Gideon. Jerubbabel, that's Gideon. The son of Joash went and lived in his own house, and Gideon had 70 sons his own offspring, for he had many wives, and his concubine, who was in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he called his name Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father. Now on the surface, there's nothing that stands out as being terribly wrong with the way this story ends. Midian is subdued. Israel enjoys 40 years of rest in the final days of Gideon's life. Gideon himself settles down and has a bunch of kids and dies at a good old age, buried in the family uh, plot there. But when you consider that Gideon is the one called by God, raised by God to deliver God's people, and that he should be living according to God's law, well then these verses paint a whole different picture. Not only was Gideon not raised up by God not to be the king of Israel, but only to be her deliverer, even God had raised him up, even if he had raised him up to be the king, it would be in violation of the law. Deuteronomy 17, 17 says of the kings, and the king shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver or gold. But that's not all. The Mosaic law also specifically forbid intermarriage with Canaanite women in verse 31 tells us that he had a concubine and she was from Shechem. So Gideon essentially elevated himself above the Torah. Gideon apparently believed that the law no longer applied to him. He seemed to have the idea that he could do as he pleased and there would be no consequences for his actions. And he paid a high price for his rebellion. You and I will as well. When we come to the place where we believe that we can do as we please, regardless of the cost to God and to others, we're deceiving ourselves. There's always a price to pay for disobedience, and the price is high. When we walk in our ways that are not in His ways, our paths that are not in His paths, there is a terrible price. Our foolish decisions can put a bad taste in our mouths. A taste very much like sour milk. And they want the people that see us, that talk to us, that see our testimony and our witness, won't desire the things of God. The way that we act toward God, His people and His Word and His will speaks more loudly than the words that we say. Therefore, this morning, would we all be careful how we act? Be careful in this community how we act. Be careful in this community what we say. Be careful with what we involve ourselves with because the way that we live our lives will have such an influence and an impact. 
Gideon failed the test at the end of his life. He was called by God to deliver the people, to speak for God. And there were moments where he was on a trajectory upward. But as his life came to a close, all of that was for naught, for temptations of secular, spiritual, and social credibility. Would we be on guard? Would we run the race such that when we do pass from this life to the next, we would hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray.